and we're back with War Tactics, where we go over the top performing orc list with the stats and the facts, go over all their matchups, see how they do. Let's get into it, boys. So the orcs, post data slate, coming in with only two, yes, that is two, lists that only went four and one. If you hear X and one, as that would be at the top of this, that just means X is in a non-value that can be shown because sometimes it'd be greater than four. And then one, meaning they only dropped one game or less. Now, you can see we only have two of that compared to the 100 games that were played of Orc players in relation to, let's say, some of our hard matchups, such as Custodians with 110 players but five placings uh, and Necrons with eight out of 108 player, 80 players. But if you look up a little more, you can see two un you know, unexpect, unexpecting, unassuming contenders up here with the Sisters of Battle, Thousand Sons coming in with 60, greater than 60% win rates and two placements in there of X and one. And then we have three Black Templars, which didn't surprise anybody. I just wanted to bring that up because they're going to be relevant into the list that we go over today. So um, normally I bring up the fat, the stats and it goes faction by faction matchup, but it's still a little bit too soon. So we'll skip over that part. Let's just go straight into the list. So these are the two players that performed four and one this weekend. We have James Ball and Joshua Colward, right? These are the two players on four and one. There were no other. And they both happened to be at the same event, which was the beachhead brawl. This is in England. You can see it's the ITC major event. That means they're most likely using WTC terrain. Um, and this is in England. So a huge amount of players like with like 160 something like 60 67 or something um so that's still really good you can see very good placements here there's steven box from vanguard tactics shout out to you um so with these players we're gonna go over their matchups and let's see where they drop the ball no no pun intended there james ball and let's take a look at their list so he said we've been trying to contact we're trying to reach you regarding your car's extended warranty that's what he called this list so we have a beast boss on foot, big mech and mega armor, Captain Bad Rook, war boss, follow me, lads. Quite light on the characters is something I want to point out here. Um, I know a lot of different orc characters are like, hey, you know, I'm constantly taking too many characters. I'll make lists of 700, 800 points. That even happened to me. That was, you know, I was making lists like that at one point. Yeah, here's already another archetype of people deciding I'm going to go for more value, more stuff, which in this meta, I can see totally working as we'll go through this in a bit, right? So we have Beast Nagger Boys, 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 Boys. One truck, but not only one, not only two, but yes, three. Three battle wagons, a unit of flash gets, three units of Gretchen, one big unit of Mega Knobs with twin kill saws. Shout out to twin kill saws. A two man unit of Mega Knobs, a big unit of what we like to call the Scapel Knob unit. So in this list, he's going hard. He's bringing all the transport, all these small units while they're still packed up in this wagon, right? He's still taking multiple 10-man units so they can get out, play the mission, get in a skirmish. Wagon keeps moving. Disembark on different sides without having to touch and keep cohesion. That way, maybe one unit can actually disembark in safety, even if the other one gets sacrificed. But people can't just straight up shoot a 20-man brick out of the wall, um, out the way. Because that's the hard part about when you want wagons is when people start to disembark, it gets a little bit uh, shifty, right? Of course, you can always put 10 boys or 10 beast snagger boys with flash kits in one of those trucks. I mean, wagons, then you could take knobs and then some boys, mega knobs. So here you have pretty much SWAT teams, but these are big versions of what we like to call SWAT teams around here. We have two different units in one transport. That way you can throw different tools out as you need them. Very fun, different take. And of course, it's the rise of the battle wagon. Um, a lot of people are like, I don't know how I feel about it. I was one of the people to tell you, you know, I don't personally think they have a you know, a very, very great place to go if you're just running one, but you need to run two. Now we've seen three. Wasn't even expecting three. I know people joked about it. James Ball don't joke about it. So let's see his matchups. So going into his first matchups is against Adeptus Custodes. That's what I'm looking to see, right? I want to look right away to see, does he have the, nope, and he, right off the bat, that's reason, normally I go right off the top bottom. I wanted to point out, does he or does he not have grab tanks? Um, when we talk about custodes and being a direct hard competition matchup for orcs, we tend to disregard that they have a very difficult time disembarking us. Um, in my opinion, the matchup greatly increases in difficulty when they have Caladius grab tanks involved. Um, but if they do not, you take advantage of the fact that you have big transports, you can stage peacefully, 
You can disembark, get the initiative, and hit them as hard as possible. You can use the wagon to stop them, to move them, to tag them, to delay them. Um, all different things that the wagon can start cutting up to play. Custodes don't have great AP. A lot of them actually has AP minus two. So wagon having reduced AP by one means it can actually touch and tag these boys while the other boys run around and play the mission. Um, it saves them from the Alaris. You know, the Alaris custodians are great at just shifting boys. Uh, knobs, flash gets the reroll wounds. Even if they're winning on sixes, they have good volume. They'll chip you away. Um, in this case, they're not getting the initiative on you. Uh, they can teleport. You do have to be aware of that. You still have to be a very well played character. Uh, Kyla Draxus really helps with damage um, at range to a certain extent with custodes. And he did not bring the dreaded. Uh, oh, actually, he did, sorry. I was going to say the dreaded triple warden bricks, but he didn't. He only brought two, which is still very difficult, even if you just bring two, popping those four up. Feel no pain. Something to keep in mind as well as a orc player when you go into these custodes remember flash kits are very very useful to drop them to that threshold where they're getting wounded on threes or even twos sometimes um of course wardens can you know go back up to threes but a good custode player understands how to use go to ground and will maintain that he has cover when your flash gets go into him so be aware of that have multiple targets when you go into that that's normally where i'm actually looking to put my flash kits come time into those grav tanks he doesn't have them i can totally see where he got off on this i'd love to see the mission great job james ball love to hear out that's something that a high level level player pulls off they go they use their transports they use their high oc and their bountiful boys and only a couple killing units to go out there and play the mission put up a 93 point win on the custodes that's just straight piloting in a lot of ways right the next mass up we have adeptus sororitas right these girls took a little hit let's see what's going on with them so we have the imagifier uh, sorry imagifier magnifier sorry i messed her up morgan vol i actually really appreciate that and then the palatine you see they drop their little uh six woman cathedral not cathedral <laughs> i'm having a, a brain fart right now but they're having they drop their sister that allows them to give them their character allows them to give them a bunch of miracle dies at whim they still have a good access to Miracle Dice with Litanies of Faith and Sisters themselves. So we have a Sisters of Battle Squad, another Sister of Battle Squad, one Immolator, but then a Rhino. Three, yes, three big 10-man units of Arcoflagellants. This is another reason why I have dropped off from bringing big bricks of 20 boys. Um, but yet something like a bunch of boys, 10-man units of just straight boys, will go into Arcoflagellants and you don't feel as bad when they fight on death or they beat you up. Um, Pretty nice. And they can't actually trade you out that well. I mean, that unit costs more than the boys do. So then we have a Castigator, another Castigator, another Castigator. Now, Castigators are great in two Squigog boys, for example. Strength 10, minus 1, multiple, I believe, flat 3 damage, if not plus 1. Yet, when you look at a Battle Wagon, yeah, Strength 10, going in T12, doesn't cut it. Reduce AP by 1, and I'm touching cover, doesn't cut it. So you can see how this starts to fall off, not actually have proper targets when you threat saturate with something like a battle wagon. You're also stat checking them. Is it a Dominion squad and a Paragon Warsuit squad, the Seraphim to run around and do the mission, and the Caladius Assassin to run around and do the mission? Sure, sisters have great activations. They can still put melts into you when they need to, but they like to meet you in the middle of the table. And if they can't start reliably popping your transports and then activating in the combat phase as well with those Archiflagellants or Overwatch or whatever it may be, when you do reach that mid table, they're going to have a hard time because even a reduced or a weak, what we consider a weak unit of boys can pick up these small units of sisters and beat them on the mission as well. Does it take a good skilled player to do that? Absolutely. Now we look at his third matchup. This is the matchup that he did lose. 74 points is a respectable loss. Let's see what he went into for food for thought. He went into the adeptus mechanicus when we did the tier list rank video i did not put a adeptus mechanicus as a very difficult matchup um and i'm still gonna hold to that they can be difficult if some archetypes that you have really it comes down to if you're playing a skew can they go into you uh with some of their units they can but at the same time if you're going into any faction in 40k that you have not faced before and had a straight play on into you have a good chance of dropping that game because they'll catch you off guard, especially at a competitive play where they're not going to baby you and let you know that, hey, don't do this. I'm going to mess you up. Um, you could run into traps, get messed up. So I'm still holding to my reins, but that can go either way. So we have Skatari Marshall, Tech Priest, Manipulus, another Tech Priest, Manipulus, Skatari Vanguard, Skatari Vanguard. And then the Breachers actually had the capability to pop wagons. Uh, we have the Stalkers, which get to get a move around. I believe they come down. Um, the Skytalkers, yeah, they get to move and then go back into reserve. And then we have one, two, 
three of the Bal uh, Balistari Twin Cognis Last Cannon. So if you're running triple wagons and someone decides I'm going to come at you with twin las cannons and breaches, yes, you're going to have a hard time. Then you have these multiple dragoons that can run up and clean up your infantry. They're actually fast enough to close the distance on your wagons if you start to stage. And then he comes with a couple transports in case he has to play the side flanks of the mission. Could they catch you off guard? Yes. Um, is this actually just a bad counter in some ways to the triple war battle wagon list? Absolutely. And that's what you have to be ready to happen when you're playing because even James Ball being an exceptional player put up 74 points, but it wasn't enough to actually put him in the win. Then we go into his fourth matchup, which is Blood Angels competitive playing the Gla uh, Cl Gladius Task Force, which I think is their best version um, of detachment they can bring. But if they bring their own detachment, the Sons of Sanguinius, it, it does get into orcs for the most part. We have a chaplain with jump pack, Commander Dante, Judiciar, with under vitamin, Lamartis, Librarian of Phobos Armor, li Lieutenant with combi weapon and artificial armor, and Sanguari Sanguinius Priest with a jump pack. Sanguinary Priest with a jump pack. <sighs> it feels a bit character heavy, um, even though they are all quite cheap. So... We have an Assault Intercessor, Assault Intercessor with Jump Pack. We have two of those. Ball Predator, Blade Guard Veteran, Death Company Marines with Jump Packs. Death Company Marines with Jump Packs again, but this is a five-man unit. Infiltrators, Repulsor, Vanguard Veteran with Jump Pads. So I really much appreciate that he's constantly coming with Jump Packs. He's ready to go. Yet again, like we like to talk about, you're not popping my wagons as long as I pre-measure you and you're not using a big enough unit, maybe if I chip you an Overwatch, you're not going to wrap me, you're not going to blow me up, and if you do, maybe one of them, and then you actually don't trade too well when I run into you, if I choose to automatically fight in death, um, you know, into something like a death company, for example. Death company and knobs, psh, just go trade out. Here we go. Go ahead, right? Uh, flash kits can pick you up when you're moving around the battlefield, these jump pack rings, so a good, jump, uh, good flash kits placement in this kind of matchup helps deal with other counting melee armies as well, countering melee armies as well, so... I'm really much into that, but let's see his, is that his fifth, his fifth matchup, which is going into the world eaters. What this is the list? Let's see what the world eaters archetypes kind of looking like, right? We got an Angron, Lord Invocatus, no enhancement. Um, world eaters, demon prince with wings with the blum and azen, a helm of brazen ire. This one wasn't brought before too often, but here I'll just tell you what it does plus one armor save. Um, and it has damage. So it makes this Demon Prince kind of like a wannabe Katan. Then we have a World Eater, because because they also get a 6-up Feel No Pain from the army rule they choose to. Master Execution with Berserker's Glaive. And then, oh yeah, and the Lord on Juggernaut with Favorite of Corn, which, you know, you kind of need to bring if you're going to bring Angron. So we have Jackals, Corn Berserkers, Corn Berserkers, just to ex escort those melee characters. Multiple Chaos Bond. These Chaos Bond can end up giving a great Feel No Pain if you pick an army-wide Feel No Pain. So that's why earlier I mentioned you can have the Feel No Pain because you could choose to as a World Leader to have a six of Feel No Pain, which for the spawn, it becomes a better Feel No Pain. Then we have World Eaters with the Forge Fiend, World Eaters, Mauler Fiend. I think Mauler Fiend is actually pretty dope if you ingress it. Um, you know, and if you have any kind of, let's say, like shooting, for example, you shoot it with this World Eaters Forge Fiend. The Mauler Fiend now gets plus two to his charges when it comes in for reserve because if it Pretty much it gets like a bloodthirst kind of thing where if something's hurt already, not at full health, it gets plus two to his charges. So it becomes a reliable, really hard hitting, uh, well, reliably hard hitting um, rapid ingress unit with a good tank shot. That being said, world leaders run into the same problem here where they run into a lot of other times is going into orcs. You're not popping our transport. You don't shoot. Um, you can run up in our face all you want. But if I can actually get the initiative off on you and then when you when I when I do get my big unit to you or you do get your big unit to me, I could fight on death. Um, which in a sure to fight on death into an elite army really, really hurts them. I would just say this World Eater Demon Prince, though, does need to be handled because uh, flash kits are not going to deal with him. And if the person's smart, he'll try to hunt down your flash kit unit real quick if he can. Um, so I'm not really surprised by that outcome, but it did prove to be his lowest scoring win just because with World Eaters, you have to play KG because they can do what you do, but quicker, a bit more reliable with closing the distance, hitting you very hard. They just can't do it enough to beat orcs in a win, you know, to pull through on an orc win. Um, I believe that was Mark Davis, right? Just giving a little. Yep. Okay. So then from there, let's look at his final game. Last but certainly not least is against Death Guard Plague Company. That's what I'm talking about. So we have Mortarion, Death Guard, Sorcerer, and Terminator armor. This guy is annoying. He allows the Death Shroud to reduce damage by one in melee. He has his once per game where he could just go and shoot crazy from psychic powers with strength eight minus two to three damage. Then we have the Lord of Violence with Leading Plague, Tallyman, Plague Marines, Plague Marines. 
the librarians. So these are small units. Interesting. I found that kind of interesting. Notice here, there's no fight first character. There's no critical wounding character. Free grenades. That's a big loss. Um, but I'm sure he was trying his own kind of twist because he does have Martarion. This Blight, Horde, Blight Lord Terminator unit is definitely getting that sorcerer. Um, if it's not, then I guess it's a death shroud because they get plus one of them. But I'm just going to assume you put it in there because it's the biggest unit. You could choose. I'm not sure how I did it, but the Lord of Yerlins can go with them too. Um, then we have two Poxwalker units. The Blight Hauler, two of them, two Blight Haulers. In my opinion, they just don't do enough damage for what they are, but they're super annoying. I try to dislodge for 100 points. A Plague Burst Crawler, a Rhino, and then two Nurglings. So it is a very much different Death Guard list. Um, the fact that he ended up playing him at the very end was kind of surprising to me that a Death Guard player kind of went to the end top tables right there. I'm not sure where he was, but maybe I'm missing something on that archetype, but not have seen it before. Don't know too much about it. I think it's significantly weaker than some of the other ones, but James handled it because that's one of our hardest matchups. He just ran them over a great job. It still takes good piloting because Mortarion's still on that list. You still have to deal with some crawler indirect that can still start messing up your grats and your home scoring. So great job to James Ball. Greatly appreciate you. Now, before I go and look at Joshua Colward, let me see what you gets are doing. Let me see what you guys got to say. Whoa, whoa, snazzy gas. Keep doing what you're doing, boss. Whoa. That is absolutely the for sure biggest uh, super chat we've ever received here by far. And we did get a second monitor coming in. So I would see that sooner on my following on my following stream. But holy crap. And then 20 gifted wall tactics memberships. Ooh, let's go. Uh, all you guys better be collecting that getting nice and swole, getting that wall energy flowing. None of you guys should be around here with no little runt by your name. Turn into a squig. Join the great wall because snazzy gazzy is picking you lads up so let's go i appreciate you snazzy gazzy that's awesome and then we have uh down under gamer great channel mate i'll send you a picture someday of my 40k of my 40k of warhammer 40k orcs absolutely you definitely should i see you got a guard there a little emblem i love guard too i have a full tempest of science force and i had to get rid of my other guard because it was just too much horde horde because i had mids too uh but Hey man, we're two sides of the same coin. Uh, Astro Mel Time and Garb. We love it. We love just getting stuck in and dying and by, by controlling our rate of attrition and still winning the game by playing it. Mission. So great job. Uh, I, I mean, great by you. Send those pictures to me. We do our hobby streams and I appreciate you. Thank you very much. And then we have Ecop, of course, coming in with the five gifted memberships. Let's go. He always coming around here with them, boy. Ecop. Ecop. Yeah, I remember, dude. I got this. Ecop. Maybe I messed it up last time. I love you, though. Every time you do that, it makes me laugh every time I see your stuff. Again, Snazzy Gazzy, biggest, uh, biggest, biggest chat, uh, super chat and gift back to back with every stream. I'm a little lost for words. I'm a little caught back by surprise, but I greatly appreciate you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll go look at the chats in a second, guys, after I go this one more list. And then before I go into the next tournament, I'll get to your questions that we're having because this list actually does somewhat go in tandem with the other one. So here we have Joshua Callward. He did go four and one as well. So let's see how my boy Joshua Callward's list look, which I'm not surprised. Let's go. So we have War Boss, War Boss, Gaz, Gulthraka, and Captain Badra. Love it. Nice and clean. Very neat. Again, we see a not overly saturated, not only overly inflated character list here. Um, not even Maz. Again, you don't see another Maz on this other list that went well. And why is that? So we have a 10 man unit of Beast Snagger Boys, another 10 man unit of Beast Snagger Boys, Flash Gits, three. Max unit, uh, 11 man units of Gretchen, a two man units of Mega Knobs just for Gaz, a two of my favorite Knob Scapel units, nice big bricks. That way, when Gaz go off, imagine both sides of those guys are getting lethal and then one popping lethal on fives from Carnage. Amazing. Only one Storm Boy unit, which is kind of what I'm running right now. But yet, we have one, two battle wagons coming back into play and then two trucks. I really like this. I can really appreciate this because essentially one truck in each lane, one wagon in each lane, and then one truck in support. You get popped, they can jump in another truck. Maybe your more elite infantry are in there. Um, maybe just your small skirmishing boys are in there, like the Beast Tanker boys in each truck, and you run them up first, and let the wagons kind of come in after. Very interesting. Different twist, but yet we see on the other list, triple battle wagon. Now we see double battle wagon with, get with trucks, but he has Gaz as his support. So let's look at his, some of his matchups, because you can see Joshua Callward started going hot right here. So we have on his first matchup, where he got 100 points, he went into 1,000 suns. So we have Adelman. Exalted Sorcerer uh, on Disc of Zeech. Exalted Sorcerer Disc on Zeech. Infernal Master, Magnus the Red. 
Thousand Suns Demon Prince with Wings. The only thing that surprised me here was the Thousand Suns Demon Prince with Wings. Um, one, two, three Rubric Marines, two units of Munilek Vortex Beast, two units of Cultists, two Zangoran Lightnings. So I love that he's at least trying to bring just more units for more activations. He still wants to do damage with these characters and their and enhancements. Still bringing uh, Magnus and Aramon is on still pretty awesome. But you just don't have enough to deal with orcs for the most part, right? It takes a very, very high level T Suns player to be able to be patient enough in the face of all the wall energy and all that green tide to selectively kill what he has to kill, give away what he has to give away to keep chopping up the board and move up the board, really take advantage of Magnus in that place. But if they don't, orcs just run game on them, especially if you're running two Munilus Bork Dex Beasts, you're holding up the back of the board, not enough to hold me back. I'm running into you, which is what Joshua Callward did. But right away, going into the second matchup, this is actually where he picked up his one loss. So let's look at that. And by no surprise, it's Imperial Knights. Now, what I mean by that is Imperial Knights are not seen as one of our more super difficult matchups in our tier list, but it is one of those matchups that we said, if you bring the wrong or a different orc archetype than something like Squig Hog Boys or something that's not exactly already meta from what's been common prior to the data slate, such as a bunch of wagons, Imperial Knights can mess you up because they do great into our mechs, great into our armor, because that's essentially what they have. They just have a bunch of high AP, high damage weapons, um, and then they can just bring a bunch of little, uh, just enough of the Helverins and the Warglaives, a couple assassins here to play the mission, and then, of course, he still has to be an exceptional knight player to be able to stay away from you to not get blown up on the wall and killed when gas is there to give lethal and unbridled carnage. But all in all, you know, you don't want to see a uh, Knight Lancer and Canis Rex, especially not Canis Rex, when you're running multiple wagons, like, oh, here we go. These are gonna, these guys are going to have a hard time. And then he has just enough little headruns to sit back and try to shoot and, and deal with you. So this still had to be an exceptional Imperial Knights player to be able to take down Joshua Callward. So it's, it's not just that it's hard, but when you're running that kind of match type, it can be very hard. So he's still just trying to play the mission by getting 70 points, but it happens. So in his third matchup, though, again, he put up another 100 point win. And by here, he's going Adeptus Mechanicus. So we have the Tech Priest Manipulus, Tech Priest Manipulus, Tech Priest Manipulus. Oh, very creative. No, I'm just kidding. And then we have one, two, three, Skatari, Marshall, oh, sorry, Skatari Vanguards, right? All of them? Yeah. Skatari Vanguards. But here, like we've seen on the opposite of the other list, he doesn't have a ton of chickens with last cannon. Instead, he went all Breachers. So the Breachers do really, really good damage. Um, they have like an odd durability to them. They're just not really that slow. They're just kind of slow and they don't really play the mission too well. Um, I feel like you would still have board control on this list um, and they have nothing to really hold you back. The other list had all those chickens that can run you down, pick up your elite infantry, even use their big stupid bases to slow you down if they have to. So instead, he just has a fat gun line. We have the Onager Doom Crawler, the Sterilizers. Maybe these are the guys that actually go back into the... I even messed up their names sometimes. No, no, no. The Sterilizers are the guys that hit stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, wait. No, these are the talent guys. I was wrong before. These are the guys that go into Deep Strike Reserve when I said it before. I'm sorry to anybody I messed up. I'm a prop. Oh, that was messed up of me. These are the guys that can actually get back up, go into reserves, and come back down. Very cheap for a unit like that. It's pretty much Storm Boys, but they get to go back into reserves. Uh, Cerberus Raider, Cerberus Raider, um, Infiltrators, Infiltrators. So I like that he brought a bunch of different activation units because he just wants to sit behind his breachers and just lay down the firepower because that's the most reliable firepower that they have in Adeptus Mechanicus right now. Um, but as you can see, you're not playing the mid-table, unlike that other list that actually did get a win over the Orc player. He had stuff that can, once he popped your wagon, once he popped your truck, he could run you down and charge you on that. In this case, he didn't. Um, so then he's going to his fourth matchup. Joshua put up another 100-point win here. Mind you guys, every time you do something like that, you start putting hundreds, 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 you know that your next matchup is getting progressively much, much harder because just... Getting a win, just like another person, isn't exactly equal. The immense score you get by getting 100 puts you up against the next next person, best person that you possibly can. And then you do it again. You're very much doing the opposite of submarining. You're sky rising right there. You're going for every hard matchup uh, that you possibly can end up running into. So in his, what was that? Yeah, in his fifth, what was that? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, I had a brain fart. One, two, three, four. Let me see, Craig. Yeah, in his fourth matchup, he went into another war boss. Um, and this war boss had the Mushroom Kingdom. So we had a Beast Boss, Gazgul, Captain Radrock, Nabon Smash Squid, El Wapis Kill Chopper, War Boss in Mega Armor, and a Weird Boy. This is uh, looking like a very common archetype that we would be running as in our community or the or works as a whole prior to the data slate. We have one Beast Naga Boy unit, two trucks, flash gets, 
two Gretchen, a kill rig. I spoke too soon. A Mando, three Mega Knobs, a big unit of Mega Knobs, the Squig Hog Boy Brick, and Storm Boys. Um, this comes into one of those things where I go, one kill rig? One kill rig? Do you just reserve it in some of your matchups? The nice thing is when you do have Mandos, which I'm going to do a video on Mandos because I'm sold on Mandos right now in this meta, Mandos help you create place for something like a kill rig or Squig Hog Boys that are come running up the table. Really helps against all those infiltrating units, all those scout units. Um, but when you're going into that proper get with Joshua Callward, you know, he doesn't have optimal stuff to stop those wagons from, from staging unless he did go first, which I'm just going to assume he didn't. Um, the reason I'm going to assume he didn't go first, I could totally be wrong, is because these mandos would be a huge issue if he went first. Um, because all those wagons means that he could just step in the wagon lanes and slow down all those wagons if he really chooses to. Um, so I'd really like to hear how this game went. I love to see that they both were using um, uh, gas because gas was looked on down upon a little bit for the beginning of the edition. But I'm super stuck on gas. I think he's amazing. So he's gonna be he's gonna be everywhere. He was already everywhere prior to the data slate. He's gonna be everywhere post data slate, guys. No matter what anybody on other channels or communities or Reddit tell you, promise you on my left green toe, gas is very useful. Um, and he would just catch so many enemies off guard with that much damage. So we have his lowest scoring matchup with Joshua with only a 63 point win going into Thousand Suns again, right? But we have Aruman, Magnus the Red, Infernal Master, Infernal Master, Thousand Suns, Demon Prince. I'm seeing that guy again. And a Thousand Suns Sorcerer. Rubric, 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 Rubric. So a little bit more Rubrics. To his Angor. Mutalix Vortex and a Rhino. Almost looks identical. This is where it comes down to the pilot, the character, and also, like I always like to say, the mission. Um, so very interesting that he got such a low score. Uh, a little disappointing that, you know, I don't know why it happened. It definitely does happen. You can time out. I'll play it can take too long. Um, weird kind of hard to score mission. Um, but definitely wanted, you know, that could have definitely thrown him up into like top 10 if that didn't happen because he was doing so good. So great job, Joshua. And then going into his last but not least matchup, he went into a Dracardi. We have the Archon, 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 Beast Master, and Lilith Hexbrass. Uh, Cabalite Warriors, Witches, Witches, Raider, Raider, Venom, 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 <laughs> Court of the Archon, Kronos, Incubi, Incubi, Mandrakes, Mandrakes, Scourges, Scourges, Scourges. Oh, goodness. Um, this is just a lot of activations, a lot of different units. Um, and the good amount of these actually have the potential to blow up vehicles. Um, just to keep it frank, we have the where they are these scourges do have dark lances. Of course, they're not super reliable, but they are dark lances. Um, of course, I want to bring up the mandrakes again, talking about something that can get early up into the uh all over the table, completely score the mission. Very annoying. Um, the venoms like orcs don't love to see these venoms luckily flash kits can still kind of like mess them up for the most part but we don't like to see other transports that help other melee armies stage better than us and then get out hit you and then run back into their transports like some of them can do um i believe witches can do that but i believe any sorry any of the units can do that based off a of strap but witches can move in any direction so you have to be aware of that um and then we have the the, the there are only two raiders here with the dark lances so we know that with their plus one to wound, additional AP, um, having the the Archons in there, they can beat you up in a skirmish so, so well. Um, but like always, they're still Eldar. They're still very soft. Something that I'm for sure, for sure, knowing that helps in this matchup is when you have Flash gets staged somewhere where they start punishing these units for trying to move around the battlefield. They don't necessarily have a lot of volume range shooting. So the Eldar do have to come and get stuck in with you. Sure, they have good anti-tank, like tank, anti-material weapons with those uh, Dark Lances, and they do have Splinter Cannons and such like that. Still not really a significant amount to scare Orc players. They have pistols. They can throw these Phantasm Grenades. You have to be everywhere else for anti-tank as well. But all in all, um, they're going to try to just charge you. That's where they're looking to deliver the most of their damage, where CP management of fight and death, um, still trying to artist nails on certain units. I wouldn't say on this list necessarily. But even a small unit of boys running up to a, a Venom if it can, which it probably can't because it has reactive movement. But for example, um, sorry, I was thinking of the tat Was the Talos on here, right? Where was he? There's Incubi. Oh, Kronos, sorry. Something like this Kronos, very stupid and annoying for 50 points, but when you have Gaz and Lethals or if you just have the proper units, they'll run this guy over 
Oh, and Court of the Archon. You know, I actually forgot what this does off the top of my head. I didn't even see that it was on here. I have to be a look right into this. Um, I'm actually looking to get a game into Dark Elder this weekend, so I should be able to be far, far more knowledgeable in this. Of course, I know just what they do with their strats, and I can get out, ignore Overwatch, so you have to be aware of that with your Flash Gits, um, with the Nightmare Shroud. If you identify that one and say, well, the Flash Gits are going to move away from that. Um, other than that, Mission does play a huge factor. Eldar still don't play the primary too well, um, and that's just that's just a fact. So the mission play will matter. You just have to be a KG Orc player, not give them all and let everything charge into you and run back to their transports. So a great job by Joshua Callward. As you've seen, between these two Orc players, we had five battle wagons. So are battle wagons viable? Can battle wagons be played? Yes, absolutely. But you need the threat saturation all the time and that just goes for orcs as a whole when we talk about controlling your rate of attrition having threat saturation is a part of controlling your rate of attrition um you have to be like well i can give this away but not multiple of these away you have to look at your enemy and know do they have enough weapons to pop all my transports should i be hiding them do they not have enough so i could just charge everything in their face stand in the middle of the table say go ahead and pop one of my trucks i still got all my other wagons so this is very much a general ship ability um and metric to go by but very viable and if you're going to run kill rigs in response you'll probably end up going three and two instead but if you bring multiple kill rigs you can still have a very similar response and then we got five gifted memberships from wicked joe Ooh, let's go wicked joe like always super reliable appreciate you get i know you getting stuck in so i have a couple questions here i want to go over before i move on to the other players who ended up going three and two that i still think we should go over guys because yes these are the only two that went four and one that's fine, but I have a few theories for that and things that I think we should just talk about as a community. So, super dumb question. Do Meganauts gain cover versus minus 2 AP, and would the save be a 3 plus? Yes. Yes. Um, it's funny you bring that up, because you know what's not a dumb question, um, Mr. Brown? Uh, is something that's helping you teach 40, learn 40K, but something that I can actually feed off this is going to ground with your Mega Knobs. Um, That's another way to give yourself increased uh, save in a way that people wouldn't be expecting and that's the only way that uh we'll catch someone off guard with mega knobs the great armor save then you can stack that with artist nails if for some reason you have enough cp and really just throw people for a loop <laughs> when you're standing in the middle and objective right then we have let's see what you guys got to say throw this back up here in a second when while you guys keep going okay i'm just making sure i'm not missing none of you guys none of you boys Oh, been playing with the Mega Knot spam. I see that. So he goes, Whoa, been playing around with Mega Knot spam list with two wagons. Feels pretty solid. Absolutely. Now you see it really is going pretty solid. RTT this Saturday for me. Double SWAT teams. Whoa. Yeah. Just make sure you do have, you know, a couple tools for dealing with armor, you know, armored elite infantry, or if you got to deal with a monster, something like a beast boss on foot, stuff like that. So SWAT teams are great. Love, you know, a five man unit of knobs with the war boss, power claws. Beautiful. Yes, only three likes. I'm not doing a good enough job, Aaron. Don't worry. Uh, crazy part, Josh List is at 1980 points. He had enough for an enhancement. That wow, wow, get that's hilarious. <laughs> he was just like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't even care. I don't count. <laughs> also, have you had any trouble with Wheezy Wiggins with wagons? Primarily trying to kit bash wrecking balls and have the appropriate amount of shooters, etc. I would say just do your absolute best. Um, pretty much no one's gonna really check you on it. Uh you might run into one guy. That's why I can't say nobody really, but you might run into one guy who decides he wants you to be WYSIWYG and he doesn't appreciate it. You don't have it, but I would say make your own, you know, just make your own. I mean, you can use green stuff, make a little ball, put it on a chain, not even make it spiky if you don't want to, just so you can have it. Um, and then for trucks, I mean, nobody really expects the wrecking ball in the truck. So don't even worry about that, to be honest. Um, but you do kind of want to have the flange so that you don't feel like you're modeling for advantage. But I know my, my actual wrecking ball like fell off because I had my little knob thing hang off the side. So, yeah, that's just a part of the that's just a part of how it goes. You get so let me real quickly go pull up the next orc players that we're gonna go over. And here we have uh, the Brenton 40k GT, but there's only 27 players, so that means it didn't end up being a GT. But I thought it was interesting to go over because these are other orc players that did well with good scores. I've seen Graham Russell before, I believe. So I wanted to look at him. And actually, this Robert Atkinson is actually an orc player, too. For some reason, he's named Adeptus, Aurora, uh, Adeptus Astartes. So I'm going to pull his list real quick. And he says, knobs. They're hard, and they're fast, and they're coming for you. Works. So we have Captain Badrook, Mazda's Crag Bag, Warboss, 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 Mega Armor, Warboss, Mega Armor. And here we see, and I'm just going to break it to you right now. Both of these gets, from what I understand, we're running 
uh, a bunch of trucks and a battle wagon on this one. But both of them are running pretty much what was the old archetype, right? If you can see here, this is the first list we went over or we're going into. He's run just trucks. One, two, three, four, five trucks. Flash gets Gretchen, Mega Knob, Mega Knob. I love the twin kill saws personally. Knobs, knobs, storm boys, storm boys. That's it. He just said trucks fit as many knobs as I can on here. Can't go for triple knobs because it becomes outrageously expensive. Technically, flash gets are knobs too, but they per fit perfectly on these five trucks. Just imagine each one of those trucks has essentially a missile unit that can get in there and get stuck in. He did not choose to bring the big mech and mega armor. He said, I don't care about the durability. This is all about doing damage. And I tend to agree with him. As much as I do love the idea of um, baiting someone into shooting my mega knobs with a big mech, I think that's really, you know, terrain and matchup dependent. Sometimes you really just need to make sure you get in there with your hits on the wall. You don't have a lot of them, so you need to make sure you hit. That way, when you're re-rolling your wounds, you're getting very reliable amount of wounds in there, and you're able to fish for a couple more um, dead wounds if you really need to. So I like the War Boss and Mega Armor just a bit more than the War Boss and Big Mech, but both are equally viable if we're going about viableness, right? So that's Graham. Let's look at his matchups real quick. Oh, sorry. Atkinson, right? Sorry. I had uh, any anyway, rate closed the wrong one. See, it's the same list. So if Mr. Atkinson, and like I said, this says Adeptus of Sardis, but it's not. So um, you can see right here, when you actually click it, it goes into orcs. So he dropped his third and fifth game just going forward. So let's look at his first game. He went into Uppy Downy Hyper Crypt Legion Necrons. We have Chronomancer, Katan Shard of the Nightbringer, Void Dragon, Hexmark Destroyer, Locust Lord. Locust Lord, Immortal, uh, Canopus Scarab Swarm, Flayed Ones, Locust Destroyers with Gauze Cannon, Locust Destroyer with Gauze Destructor, with Imnemite Exterminator, Glass Destructor, Tomb Blades, boom. Um, I would say the one thing that this list is definitely lacking as a Necron list is, most of the Necrons are lack lacking this though, are they don't have the ability to pop your trucks at will. Right. So having five trucks is just annoying threat saturation for them. That uppy dummy hyper crypt legion, what it really wants to do is take these immortals, jump around, shoot your scoring unit, shoot your elite infantry. Um, and then as the Catan get in your face, you don't have enough time or units to get over there and start charging into those immortals, killing them as well. Um, but in this case, something like flayed ones are going to be bouncing from knobs because they're going to be wounding you on sixes if you want them to, even though they're twin link. It's still not something to be fearful of. You'll kill them. Even small arms fire sometimes works into them in a weird way. Or grenades. Tombs blades are really just for scoring the mission. And the destroyers are so, so swingy. So as long as you screen your backfield with your 30 grots, try not to get them behind you. They'll end up in some corner trying to get a weird angle. But five trucks is really good at just holding the board and not letting reserves come in exactly where they want. Remember that the hypercrypt, not everything just gets built in deep strike. Could you get deep strike units that start teleporting around? Absolutely. But as a whole, keep in mind that some of these things have to come in from strategic reserve. So that plays a huge factor if you start placing your trucks on the battle edges and saying, oh, whoa, whoa, what do you got over there? Oh, no, that's not coming in right now. Never mind. It's coming in further back because stuff is still very slow for Necrons. Besides the stuff that gets to teleport, orcs do have a good way to play into them, but that doesn't mean we necessarily um, is an easy way. If we have play into them. I play into them. Good games into them. But um, it does come down to one shot in their units sometimes and knowing when to put stuff into Catan and when to just leave him hanging and go kill everything else. So great job by Robert. That shows great generalship just right off the back to be able to take down Hypercrypt because they were they're the most winning uh, faction this weekend. Then we have right off the bat, you can see his second matchup. This is why I wanted to pull this list up, you guys, because he went into very, very difficult, you know, archetypes, you'd say. He had a Black Templars, High Marshal Hellbricked, Judiciar, Lieutenant, and then Emperor's Champion. Intercessor, Primaris Crusader Squad, uh, Ballistas, Dreadnought, Eradicator, Inceptors, Infiltrators, Land Raider, Redeemer, Sword Brethren, one, two, and then one Redemptor Dreadnought with one unit of scouts, a Vindicator Assassin, and a Caladius Assassin. So in this case, we still see the Sword Brethren. We still see the, the Land Raider. Ballistas, Dreads are not too fearful for orcs, even though they could hypothetically pop your trunk. Truck. <laughs> I said trunk. Um, and this is a bit less of activations and killing trades. We used to see triple sword brother in units right that made a huge difference because sip triple sword brothers are just looking to go pretty much trade hand in hand for not for for knobs or mega knobs either one in this case you can see he's not going to have enough stuff to exactly um you know run over orcs when they have so many knobs mega knobs 
and able to just punch through power armor. That's really where the value of Mega Knobs wounding almost everything on the Space Marine Army on twos or threes, and then re-rolling it with minus three AP. Two damage is just enough for just about everything. Um, avoid that Redemptor Dreadnought until you really have to commit into him. Kill everything else that they're using to score the mission. They'll run out of resources. If you have to, on the wall, you can even, um, you know, I would just say reliably fight on death, guys. This is one of those, I would just... I hate to try to simplify this matchup because it's really not simple, but one thing is CP management. If you're going into this matchup and you find yourself losing often, the first question I want to ask you is how is your CP management? Because if you don't have three CP at the start of his turn, I'm already looking at you sideways because you should be hoping to fight on death at least one or art is nailed somewhere, right? So if you at least don't have two, we'll say, you did not plan logistically ahead of him to do damage to you or to start this fight, right? You're, you're too, you're throwing too much resources into other, you're too much CP into other resources, not going to give you a return into a fight for his black Templars, those kind of melee armies fighting in death swings that matchup so far on its head that space Marine players hate it. Now this is his third matchup and this is the one he did lose. And he went into a hyper kept Legion King time. So we have the Catan night shard, the hex mark destroyer, the locust Lord, locust Lord plasmancer, um, I believe this, yeah, this guy was feeling pain. Um, and then this, the Silent King. Then we have Necron Warriors, which is a surprising twist. Death Marks, Locust Destroyers, Locust Destroyers, and then he brought a Monolith. So this guy brought pretty much a very odd archetype, very weird skew, considering that the Monolith can go up, come down, auto punch you with pretty much Dreadnought level punches. The Silent King himself can start popping uh, transports because of his Meneers, and then he can move around the battlefield as well. Um, and I believe those warriors can get teleported to the Monolith as well. And then that's after it already does its thing too. So a bunch of shenanigan movements on this. You still have the Nightbringer on there. You still have weird little, uh, like uh, the Hexmark Destroyer and the Locust Lord, these different characters that are going into your destroyers. Mind you, destroyers are oddly durable, you're not, you know, at shooting at them, you're not going to one shot them. So this is like a weird unit that you end, end up not paying attention to unless the enemy messes up and puts them in a range where you can get to combat with them. So just letting these guys sit back and pick different angles of fire and shoot it would be pretty tedious and, uh, you know, kind of annoying to say the least. Right. So how did this list go? I haven't played into this exact list yet. Um, no one's running the Monolith and the Silent King where I'm at, so I haven't got to see it yet. But we all have seen tactical Twitter videos talking about this for the most part. It's a odd one. So he lost that 66. I'm not surprised because your trucks have no capability to stage in that kind of matchup. You just Monolith, pfft, Silent King, pfft, start popping all your trucks, right? So it happens. Now we go into his fourth, which is just to clear the point, Robert had hard matchups. And how do we know that? Because one of his matchups was the other orc player. So we had that fellow green tide, right? So this is the other orc player that ended up going um, uh, three and two here with Russell Graham. You can see he went 100, 100, 100, and this was his fourth loss into Robert. Okay, just so you guys, just so you're following. So he has Beast Boss, Beast Boss, Gazgul, Knob with Wall Banner, War Boss, Solomilet, War Boss, and Mega Armor. Two units of Beast Naga Boys, one big brick of 20 boys, four trucks, a battle wagon, 30 Gretchen, one big brick of mega knobs, two two man units of mega knobs, and then storm boys. So he's just looking to put these knobs in the unit. That the one thing I'm sorry, the, the, oops, there's one else. One of the knobs, uh, the big thing that is weird about this army that it doesn't have knobs, excuse me, the knobs with power claws, because I really, really feel like that knob scapel unit is almost mandatory in a bunch of different matchups. So surprise is not on here. He just chose for more stuff. And I've actually moved away from running big bricks of boys because I feel like too many different armies have a good amount of activation to pop your wagon and then pick the whole unit up. But I very, very much love the knob with wall banner, compounding with Gaz and Makari lethal capability. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Um, but Robert did win that matchup. And then his final game, which he did end up losing, was into Space Wolves. Now, this is Stormlance. Stormlance is very much a possibly, you know, we'll say a high to mid-level difficulty kind of army. A little high, not high, middle, high, low. Um, but what this is, is this is one of the best versions of the Stormlands task force that I've ever seen because he found the perfect balance of a bit of shooting with not too much cavalry saturation. And then he tucked in one of my favorite units since 8th edition, Wolfen. Wolfen are outrageous for their points value. Ripped to actual boys, right? Wolfen get their hammers. They get storm shields. They get advance and charge. 
all game. They're 80 points and just a five man unit with pretty much the same amount of wounds. They get zero OC. Um, so this is pretty much when you as a smart org player starts to move block all of these Thunder Wolf Cavalry, the Wolfen are there to continue to pressure you, run up the middle, run up terrains, um, run through terrains, or they can run up the sides of the table, right? Because the Thunder Wolves are already interacting there. The Scouts might already be interacting in the middle. Um, and then you have the Salt Jump in or Pack Intercessors, followed by a only one Lancer, two Redemptor Dreadnoughts, and then one Ballistus Dreadnought, and then Henchman. I think two Lancers would probably be better, but he probably just had the points for that. And Dreadnoughts, I think they help just because they do give you that firepower with the macroplasma and AP and um, chain gun. And then if you're smart going into orcs, which I don't know if he did this or not, but putting your dreadnoughts in front of your cavalry to go first does kind of make a difference sometimes. Um, I don't necessarily mean like stage them so you can't move. I mean, when you know the wall is coming, put those redemptor dreadnoughts in a place where they're more likely to get touched because orcs have a hard time chewing through redemptor dreadnoughts. So, um, and then right there, you can see it was a good score, but he did end up dropping that game to Alexander England. Now, we'll look at Mr. Graham's list again real quick. He went three and two, but he did the what we call pretty much multiple trucks, battle wagon with bun big brick of boys, and I love to see it. I'm a big fan of that kind of list. I've ran things like that, but I still think you need flash kits and or knobs on that list when you're going to run it because it just you're just pretty much all playing the mission and it feels like a weird skew. Um, so he ended up, oops, I just touched a, I just pretty much clicked on him again. <laughs> um, right here, we went to the world eaters first game. We all know what the world eaters do. Instead, this one has Karn. I think Karn's pretty great for what he is, but Hey, it is what it is. You can see we're on defiler here in a land raider. So this guy was trying to think out the box in his last match. This, this is the second match. And he did end up losing this one to the sisters of battle. So in my opinion, he just had too many soft targets, um, for the sisters of battle on this. And the Scissor Battle have a ton of activation. So the fact that he chose to be kind of like a bunch of soft targets and then um, go into this kind of matchup. I mean, just look at all these different activations between the Seraphim squad. They're playing the mission. They're doing everything. They're jumping around the field. They're being very annoying. He was limited to 50 points there. So I always say, though, sure, that faction might not be the most difficult matchup. Faction per faction, ability per ability. But if anybody's maining a faction as a Nestor primary faction, and they maximize that, they're always going to be dangerous. So do your homework on sisters because they do have tools to deal with orcs and come weird ways between the Archiflagellants, the Castigators, Reliable Meltas, stuff like that, um, and the war suits. Still think we have great, you know, play into them for the most part. They're still power armor. They're still quite soft, but flash gets seem to play the, the factor there, in my opinion. Then in the third matchup, we have him going into the Adeptus Sororitas again. And of course, I should say, the generalship obviously matters greatly for when you're going into any T3 army, period. So we have Martyr Lady, Junith, Morgan Vall, Palatine, Sister Sister, two Archiflagellants, two units of Sacrosaints. I'm not sure if they really have a place. I haven't seen them competitively anywhere around me. The competitive players are not using Sacrosaints. They are using Crusaders. Because, dude, Crusaders, 25 points, y'all. These are just coming from reserve. It's just two homies for 25 points. And they just go, I'm going to score over here. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, Repentia, Repentia, Retributor Squad, Retributor Squad, Retributor Squad, Seraphim, much Seraphim, and then the one unit of Paragon War Suits. Very reliable damage. I really like Paragon War Suits. I think they're pretty awesome. Um, but, you know, as a whole, Orcs should have a good, you know, good activations, good potential to kill those T3 armies. And really, mission does play a huge factor. Because, like I said, sisters are looking to go go time in the middle of the table because they don't have long range for the most part like for their most damage is not long range so do they stage and go into you as an orc player or are you staging going into them right uh, who's controlling the pace of momentum is the mission allowing that all those things are factors that we can account for but one thing i do know is sisters want to meet you in the middle and if they can get off first on you when you're trying to stage they do have enough volume and enough units to take angles on you and start picking away at all your killing stuff so Good job there, Russell. Now into his fourth matchup. He did go into the other orc player and lost. We've seen that. And then his final match, he went into Sisters of Battle. So we have the Archon on the same thing. Cabalite Warriors. I don't want to say too much and that you do have Rack because I haven't got enough of my own games. So I'm going to get games since I'm probably this weekend of the Sisters of Battle. I just know that towels are freaking super annoying. Um, they're actually pretty good at killing vehicles as they get like anti-vehicle or twin link, something like that. Um, and then Scourges with their Dark Lances are something to take serious. Don't sleep on Eldar. Do your homework on what they do. The only way you're really going to lose into this matchup, other than like the mission completely throws you on its head, um, is 
if you don't know what's happening. That's the only like assured way you're going to lose a Dark Eldar because I promise you they've seen what you can do, um, but we have all the tools to deal with them. As you can see, Russell put 100 points on them because, like I said, they don't have volume of shooting necessarily and they're very soft and we fight on death and even one of our diminished units can throw them off an objective. So you can have all the movement shenanigans in the world, but if you can't play the primary, you get run over, boys. So what I thought was really interesting about this event, of course, it's a much smaller, less, um, you know, dynamic and extensive meta because you're playing against smaller player bases, not 100 as a super major like the other one was. But what we can see here is a truck archetype into a bunch of different, very tough matchups still plays a significant, valuable role. Still has a very popular place, in my opinion, in our faction. So. Do I think wagons are horrible? Uh, no. I think running one wagon can end up horrible for you if you're not ready to place him and stage him correctly and not get tagged. Do I think a single kill ring is bad for you? Most of the time, yes. But this is where we discuss threat, threat saturation. If you're playing an army that's supposed to be a horde, that's supposed to be a pressure army, you must understand threat saturation. Sometimes it's stacking the same data sheet over and over again so the enemy doesn't know how to allocate resources and sometimes it's just board control between mandos um trucks trikes just moving all over the table and getting stuff done so where are orcs going to be going forward because we only had two um x and one placings right is it our matchups in my opinion yeah it can very much be that we're going to run into a couple of our hard matchups but i also think it's orc players just trying to have fun people are kind of sick of using squigs continuously and they want to just use Battle wagons, kill rigs, beast snagger boys. They just, orc players are just similar to guard players. We just like to have fun. We're not taking ourselves too serious necessarily all the time. But those that are already can feel the negative effects of bringing battle wagons and kill rigs if you don't bring them in redundancy. But that still applies to trucks too. We need some redundancy. Now, from my own personal opinion, I think orcs are going to run into the problem of some of our good match, our hardest matchups have good infiltrators, good scouts, and I know in my personal meta, I'm going to be running commandos because I need to have that initial board presence. I need to have that open space that I can get up to and stage and continue to play. Um, and if I go first, if I go pretty much like Arca, Art of War said when they did their faction review, orcs suffer greatly from going second. Our army-wide ability used to be that we would declare a wall on our turn, which makes a huge difference when going second. Um, so hopefully that changes in the codex. Yet, something like a Mando, Trike, units that can start playing early, maybe even a solo Snickrot, are going to be very important because letting the enemy go first, take over the middle, hold every angle of fire, come in from strategic reserves to hold those angles of fire, and then saying, okay, Orc player, bring it. That's going to give a lot of people anywhere from intermediate level to lower, very hard to get feel bad games sometimes, getting straight up shot off the table. Um, or even the high level players, you're going to just go second and be like, uh, what do I do turn one? I just, you have everywhere, every single fire. I can't control my rate of attrition if you just have every lane of fire. So orcs are still doing great. I think right now we're just having a lot of fun using what we want to do. I'm not calling this where we're going to be. I'm not calling this our meta and archetype right now. I'm just saying, hey, people knew battle wagons were dope for 160. These get said we're running multiple of those. We got two, three. So if you got a battle wagon, try to collect another one. Run two if you want to in your, in your, your leagues or whatever you're doing. If you don't have two wagons, I'd recommend a wagon and a wig, a wig, a wagon and a rig. Um, but just know that they are different defensive profiles. So the enemy might just be like, oh, it's not the law. I'm going to kill the rig real quick. Right. So keep that in mind too. So let me look at your points with you guys, what you guys got to say. Uh, oh, he says, gas has been a go in every game I play him. Never leave home without my gas. -y. Yeah. And that's what we've been saying when we did our gas video. Never leave home without your gas. I'm telling you. And it's not really gas, it's Makari. Like, if I'm just going to be real, Makari has carried far more than Gaz in every single game. Um, Sorry, we already did that. Let me see what you guys got to say. Oop, I'm click that. Do you think there's a chance Uftuk makes it into the next Codex? Absolutely. Um, the fact that GW kept his data sheet pretty reasonable makes me think that he could very much get translated over into the Codex with very similar rules, like a built-in deep strike. None of his rules are too crazy. His re-rolling wounds against Titanic Titanic is not that impressive because it's just him with his low amount of attacks, with his 
kind of not impressive damage. Um, so yeah, I can see him totally being in there because he's not even that broken compared to something like the Christmas Grot, right? Or the Grot Mitzkit, right? That guy was freaking awesome. That little loan up dude running around. That's something I can see why they didn't put in. As for Uftak, very much that they're just waiting. They're going to release Ark. They're going to have a backstory for him. They're going to have a second book. All these things. Uftak could very end up being on a, in the next codex. But what I want everybody in the org community to just tell GW is stop giving us four attacks. Stop it and stop giving our Mega Knobs two attacks. You guys need to relax on that because you guys have a lot of other factions that are melee that have seven, nine attack dudes. Relax. Give us five attacks. That's all I'm asking. Put our Mega Knobs back to three. I put our Knobs back to strength 10, GW. You guys are acting kind of silly. What you doing to orcs? Um, if Tuktan makes it, may they give him better give him more strength on that. Exactly, right? I, a Snaz Hammer? You guys never even heard of a Snaz Hammer. That's supposed to be like a Shock Hammer mixed with the Power Claw mixed with uh, War Boss Strength. Why is that like a Power Fist? It's, it's silly. Um, whoa, let's go. Isn't he a limited model? Um, you know, sometimes GW does it, but they're limited. But I think he's more made to order and you could just keep trying to get him and order him. So don't be dismayed. You know, um, is he a limited time? He could be, but I think it's just GW is more aware of all the scalpers nowadays and they're just choosing to have more availability or pay to order. You know, just order him and get him in like nine months, <laughs> nine months, three months, I mean, 90 days. Bro, I hope Uptown gets a codex. I want the g type knob so bad. That would be so sick, right? Instead of being like, I need more transports. Let's just start getting deep striking knobs in. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I feel like Mega Knobs should be able to deep strike, right? Am I tripping? I don't know. I, I, there's a lot of things I think GW is uh, a little not creative about orcs. I would also say that, that the Tyranid Codex gives me hope that we can be creative. Um, the Admac Codex makes gives me no hope that GW will be creative with orcs, right? Because me and Dave were talking about this. What's going to happen to the WA? What's going to happen to the WA in a different? Is it going to be a different army wide rule, the same army wide rule? But how is that going to apply to like a speed WA? What is going to happen there? They're going to put different stipulations to it. I mean, the Tyranid's army rule is just straight up the army rule. Just take a battle shock test, hmm. right? So are we just going to have the same thing? And then the other archetypes aren't going to have like a the army wide rules like a proper support so i do have a lot of questions for it i'm definitely not negative about it because we're orcs we're never in negative because we're never beaten so it doesn't really matter what gw does we're still going to win but the point is um you know i'd like to see gw give us a proper respect snick being only minus one ap damage too while being a wet noodle is the most installing stat line runt yeah uh, he does have a odd stat line and he's 85 points like cut him down to like 70 you know, 70 points maybe because Mandos are already crazy expensive. And if if you guys aren't sure about the Commando thing, I'm going to do a video on it. Don't worry. Uh, maybe try a solo Snick Rot. Like I said, we say it's it's meta dependent. So that's where I'm at with that. Now, Orcs are still doing fine. Trucks are still where you want them to be. Knobs are still very, very much viable. If you're feeling Squig Hog Boys, I still think you can run Squig Hog Boys. Don't be afraid of it, but maybe food for thought. Consider that armies are going to be infiltrating and scouting. Therefore, you need a place to be or a place to stage, which means you need more board presence, which is why I'm talking about Mandos or Shock Jump Drags to just jump up there if you go first or scouting ahead with, um, you know, Dwart Snaga. Stuff like that. So don't be worried about that, guys. Sometimes we just need more tools for what's going on. We see a lot of these different factions are having more tools, more utility. And Art of War said this. John Lennon said this. That really made me think about it. He said, Orcs play a very, very fair game of 40K, and they probably do it better than you, which is very true. We do play a very, very fair game of 40K. So what happens if we make you have to play a fair game of 40K with us? What if I'm infiltrating and saying, you can't have these shenanigans, and I'm just on the line with you, and you're not going to overwatch me before I go tag you? Oops. What if I take over the reserve sides of the table so that you have to meet me in the mid-table? So instead of thinking we have to change um, how we want to perform our wall, just think about having more tools to counter the way they want to be shenanigan -y. Bring them to our level, knock them on the head, and say, come get some, boys. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited where orcs can be, but you know, I'm still trying to figure out this custode issue when we're going into like the best archetypes. I'm talking about like triple wardens, grab tanks, terminators. If you're going into that, I'm like, Ugh. if you're not going into that, you can always have some fun. Give us a unique... Oh, give us dedicated unique walls per detachment. Yeah. See what I mean? That's the kind of like question I have here. Like, are they going to have when you call a wall, you also get this, right? Like, I don't know. I haven't seen that. So we might just be hopeful, but that's something that we should as a community be looking out for, thinking ahead, because this is what I like to remind people, right? Wall verbs one dash two. Plan for the worst, but hope for the best, right? So be aware that. 
some things might just generally not change. We might be left with two knobs. Our wall might be exactly the same. Be aware of that. Be used to playing that way. Don't play. I'm not going to play until we get our codex out. Just go ahead and do it. Go ahead and have fun, guys. It's still 40K. It's still our toys. And Orcs is just never beaten. So like always, guys, every Wednesday and on Friday, we'll be doing a stratagem video where I go over all the Orc strats, but I also give you advice and circumstances and scenarios where knowing the actual baseline general 40K strat rules will help you as an Orc player too right? Because CP management is one of the top skills that a proper war boss needs to be a successful war boss in Warhammer 40k. Promise you that. Your CP management will go a long, long way. But there's always one thing to keep in mind. It's don't cross our wall because we knock your teeth out. Oh, let's go, boys.